Hi everyone, this is ABC's of Anesthesia and today I'm going to run a session called CRM for Nurses or Crisis Resource Management for Nurses. Now if you already have the knowledge, which a lot of us with experience will already have, these non-technical skills are the things that will really make a difference in a crisis. So let's get started. So we might get started. So as you know, this is a crisis resource management for nurses. And first, a little bit about me, I'm anesthetist here at Western Health. So unfortunately, I don't get to see many of the nurses on the wards like I used to when I was doing pain rounds at the register of it. Um, yeah, we seem to just handle crises all the time in anesthesia. And this is why I've um, started giving this talk. I used to give it a lot to the doctors, but I think as nurses, you guys are so much more experienced on average that I feel like I, I want this knowledge to fill to everyone, especially the people who are probably the longest days in, in the job and in the, in the environment. I thought we'd start with a bit of a game. So this is what we're going to do. Everyone's going to just stand up where they are and keep their hands empty. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two groups. So the first group's going to play this game and then the second group's going to play this game. And it's a bit of a competition uh, to see who can, who can win this game. Now I'll, I'll say the rules to this group first and then we'll come over to you guys. Uh, so, the rules of the game, so everyone's going to be kind of standing in a circle. So I might get Stephen just to come out here a little bit. And the aim of this game is to pass the balls around the circle. Uh, and I'm going to just feed in a ball at a time. So if you get lots of balls, that means you win. So we're going to count the balls at the end. But as soon as you drop one ball, then the game's over. So that's the rules. Uh, any questions? Good. So I'm going to start with you. And then you're going to pass it around. And then I'm going to put other balls in as the game goes on. Here you go. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you oh, so we had how many balls there? Three balls. Okay, pass those back. Beautiful. And I'll take that ball as well. So we've got three there. So now you guys are going to, I'm going to give these guys 30 seconds to discuss how they can improve on three balls. Um, and then you guys can have a chat as well. So take a few seconds. <laughs> was it was last year? <laughs> yeah, no. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, ready? Here, here. Over there. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh! oh. oh. <laughs> How many balls do you have? Two. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hey, six balls. So double the other group. You know, when, every time I play the game, it's not that different to when everyone comes together in a crisis, right? Everything's a little bit haphazard and you're not really sure what's going on. Like, you know, who's been to a Met call recently? Yeah, yeah what, what did that look like? Yeah, frantic, right? Yeah. Um, how did you feel in that time? Um, how did I feel? Yeah. Um, I think that tells me everything. <laughs> was, when I was a junior, when I was a junior doctor, I'd go into this. I'd go, oh, what's going on? I have no idea. Anyway, after that initial round, you know, you had three balls, which is actually not too bad for that first go. And then you guys had a bit of a chat about what you're going to do. And that, to me, is like when someone comes in the room and just says, "Look, guys, I'm going to lead this." What, what are we going to do? And I heard your voice pretty loud. And I heard your voice pretty loud. What, what did you guys offer to the group at that point? To throw the ball in the same direction. Yeah. Well, like these are kind of patterns or kind of rules that you're trying to set for the group. So now that you've got a shared mental model and we talk about this shared mental model a lot because most of the time in medicine, it's, it's, it is shared. Like, you know, you go into theater, everyone checks allergies, everyone knows to check fasting and then you, you know, get the surgery done. But every now and again, when the crisis happens, that's when your shared mental model just absolutely collapses. And so hopefully and what- they actually mm. copy the same sort of model, even though- Exactly. Oh, and that's a good point. Everything that, you know, I think a lot of what we do, we're just copying other people who've <laughs> made things. CRM, trust me, that's not my idea. That's uh, someone else's idea. So it, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about it. So to, the take home points there is that we can use these principles of, you know, having a shared mental model and teamwork, having leadership, and communicating these plans really effectively, whether it's a silly tennis ball game that actually doesn't mean anything, 
or you know real patients and real life stuff so so CRM is all the non-technical skills like you know maybe in nursing and definitely in med school you're taught to learn a lot of facts and you're taught to you know memorize this data and this detail and you know what are the you know seven causes of this and what are the 15 manifestations of Marfan's and whatever <laughs> else and I'm going to tell you now that once you get to a level of experience that I'm sure all of you are at those things don't matter as much because everyone's already got it. Plus, you've got Google. If I need to know the cause of something, I'm just going to Google it. But what you can't really teach is these non-technical skills. A crisis is pretty much made out of having lots of tasks and a really serious outcome and a time constraint. So, you know, just, just think of it. What's a crisis that you guys have seen? A fire. A fire, absolutely. It doesn't have to be medical. There's lots of things you got to do. There's a serious outcome and the fire can go really rapidly. Whereas if it's just a slow burning fire in a fireplace, that's not really a crisis, is it? So the context is everything. In a crisis, what do you need to make this work effectively? Team, team leader. Team leader, I hear that, leader, yeah. yep. Good working team. Good plan. A good plan, excellent, a good plan. Good communication. Excellent, and that's a lot of stuff with that. Clear thinking. Good communication, clear thinking, fantastic. And don't panic. And don't panic. Yeah, good. Rehearsal of stuff, which is like you know us running simulations or even thinking about this. So what do you need? As, as you mentioned, I need a team, so I need roles. I need a, I've got a time frame, I need to respect that. I need lots of tasks to be allocated. And, and all the other things that you mentioned were absolutely right. Um, this is a, so if you ever use QR codes, this is a, um, if you get your phones up, this will link to a very chilling, documentary about this pilot whose wife died in surgery and essentially all these things there's there's amazing staff there an experienced surgeon an experienced anesthetist um, had you know experienced nurses around yet this patient sadly and really tragically died from an airway disaster um, and that's a really good video to watch because hopefully this will you know this talk will address a lot of that so you might already know a lot of this stuff what are some of the non-technical skills that you need in a crisis Calm, absolutely. Anything else? And she mentioned a lot of these. Experience. Experience, absolutely. Not everyone has experience, unfortunately. So say you're say you're junior, hopefully you can still use these principles. What else? Planning. Say it again. Planning. Planning, absolutely. And I think of anticipating what you're gonna to need to plan as well. But you actually said these as an answer to my previous question. You need a leader, you need team, you need great communication. So back in 2005, Roll and Gabba came up with these as the essential points of good crisis resource management. The interesting thing is uh, aviation was using this for so long before that. It was called crew resource management and we just changed it around to make it crisis resource management so we can still keep the letters which is useful. Now interestingly enough, so I studied med school, I started med school in 2000, the year 2000. I only heard about CRM in 2012. And now I think that CRM, crisis resource management, is the most important thing that I know. Now the principles, so let's look at all the principles and try to apply them to a nursing context. So we're gonna take all of these and then I'll made it into a table. Now you can take a photo of this slide because I'm, we're gonna get you guys to you know, look at this and then apply it to the scenarios that I give you. What does it mean to call for help in your environment? What do you action, what do you actually do? Yeah, press the emergency buzzer. So that means like the, 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 the wall buzzer, right? And that, that's a local buzzer. So people in the immediate area come around and help you. What else do you, what else is the way to call for, call for help? Triple four. Triple four. That's right. If you guys work in um, uh, different hospitals, it's always a different number, which is a bit annoying. But triple four in, in this hospital chain. As long as it's not 007, license to kill, that's, that's the most important thing. Uh, and then when we're at home, we can call triple zero. But either way, we know how to get help. So that's important. Probably the most basic thing that you'll learn, but you know, always call for help early. We're going to get to the multiple priorities in a second. How about what can you actually do if you're not sure about who the leader is or if communication isn't happening effectively? Like, what are the things you can do for that? That's what I experienced with my recent medicals because yeah. I did not know who was the team leader. Yeah. So and how did, before, you know, when you start with, with you, I know we are in a crisis, but we need to stop and decide who will be appointed as a team leader. Yeah. Which is rough, could be the doctor mm -hmm. yep. or the triage, what, or tri triage nurse or senior nurse. Uh, senior nurse, 
you will know the environment better than most of the doctors will because you are there all the time, whereas doctors will go from ward to ward a lot of the time. So I, I think that's a really good point that you will know your staff better than any of the doctors will or the most senior doctor. So it's very important that maybe the senior nurse is there to help allocate tasks and they'll know who's leading. And sometimes stickers aren't there, which I think that, you know, they really should be. We should have completely identifiable roles as soon as things happen. The things we can action is, who's the leader? Great. Uh, I know that, you know, I can allocate someone, I can ask the question um, and I can identify that person very directly. And we'll go into why doctors and I think most people are very reluctant to put their hand up to be leaders. But we'll go through that in a second. Actually, you know, why? Why is it that when even when I go into arrest, I feel weird saying, hey, I'm going to lead this. Like, what, what is, why does that feel weird? No. Yeah, hierarchy. absolutely. Hierarchy. Hierarchy, absolutely. Is there someone who's older than me, even though yeah. they're not, and they're more experienced? I will feel weird saying I'm the leader because that's, it just feels disrespectful. Yeah. As, you know, the way I was brought up, it was very hierarchical as well. Um, any other reasons why? Fear of failure. Fear of failure, absolutely. You feel like it's all on you. So yeah, there's a lot of reasons why saying you're a leader is very confronting. And I think it's in our, in our best interest to try and encourage it. So as soon as I walk in, I go, who's leading? No, you seem like you know something. You can be the leader. And it does, doesn't mean I have to know everything. I could stand by them and, you know, give them information as, as best as I can. But it just doesn't mean you have to take all the responsibility. We'll move on. What, uh, the next stage there is they talk about cognitive aids, using all available information and cross-checking. So what are the cognitive aids that you think or have used in the past that have been really useful? Yep, yep. There's a for that Excellent. Yeah. It's really useful, especially if you don't like. Fortunately, we're not getting arrests every day. I hope not. Mm -hmm. uh, so we don't get real. We don't get very good at the things we don't practice all the time. But and and so if you're a nurse in anaesthetics, you do rapid sequences all the time. But if you're a nurse outside, maybe you wouldn't. Uh, but you do other things commonly, so you'd be really slick at those things. Um, so yeah, I found that the ALS flowcharts, the rapid sequence flowcharts, really useful. Any anything else that you guys have used? Um, and Handover sheets, absolutely. Is bar type handover sheets? Yes. Excellent. And so at that moment of a crisis, I've got all these flowcharts that come on the trolley, the ALS flowchart, the BLS flowchart, maybe the airway algorithms. But I'm also a big fan of just using Google. Um, I feel like using my memory for a lot of these things is just a waste of my intellect. <laughs> that I've got the phone that's smarter than me now. Might as well just use it for important things like arrest, you know, say I need to learn all the reversible causes. Uh, that's something that I talk about time and time again, but you know, if you haven't considered all the different causes of an arrest, maybe you can just Google four H's, four T's, and you've got the information right there. So cognitive aids can be so useful to offload your, your you know, your, your, I guess your uh, memory so you can focus on other tasks that are more important. And then I've got here some other things, reevaluate repeatedly, which is kind of obvious. You constantly reassess this patient, constantly take blood pressures, Constantly, you know, look at the SATS probe and the numbers that you get, as well as the state of the patient. Um, and then finally, anticipate, plan, mobilize resources. Emergency buzzer, call the ICU liaison, really uh, useful, call the surgeon directly, triple four. Um, ask who is leading this, like we mentioned, and have someone senior who knows their staff allocate these really, really important things. There's lots of stuff on, you know, in our intranet, on our crash carts on Google, and they have a lot of information. The ALS, BLS flowcharts, anaphylaxis guides, uh, local anesthetic toxicity guides. Uh, and then I do things like confer with colleagues. I, you know, I definitely want to know that I'm not missing out on something. So I'll be checking with my colleagues and going, hey, have I missed something? What else can I be thinking of? I need a fresh pair of eyes on this because I know that I'm fallible. Uh, and then get stuff ready and call ICU, theater, call the consultant, reg or external help, transfer, maybe even ECMO if it's that bad. Uh, and the patient you know, needs this. So I like to think of a lot of, who, who's ever not said quiet on the ward? Is that a thing? Like it's, ah, oh, it's a really quiet shift. Like, yeah. Oh, you don't say that. Yeah, you don't say that, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna say you should say that. <laughs> you're, you're, so you're trying to, it's, it's a jinx, right? But what I'm doing is, okay, this patient has had a rash. What's the worst that could happen? Okay, anaphylaxis. I'm gonna look for anaphylaxis. So as soon as it happens, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of, I'm gonna take care of it. So I, I, I believe in jinxing because to me it's anticipating and planning what's gonna go wrong and then it doesn't happen anyway. So yeah, let's go through some scenarios. I wanna want make this really practical. Um, a 25 year old male develops a rash. The blood pressure is now 80 millimeters mercury. Say so you're on the ward at Williamstown Hospital. <laughs> this is so- you So know, is that systolic or diastolic? That is systolic, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's good sometimes, but let's say not in this 25 year old male. Let's say, let's say it's 70, it's worse. What do you, what do you, so this is the patient, 25 year old, type one diabetic, but no allergies on insulin, usually well, comes in with some leg cellulitis and you give the 8 a.m. kefazolin dose and he develops hives all over his body. He's got a lot of difficulty breathing. You can hear this <gasps> wheezing sound. Yeah, allergy, but what? Anaphylaxis. Yeah, anaphylaxis, right? And so severe allergy, anaphylaxis. So this is this is pretty bad. Who's seen an anaphylaxis? Um, the start of it. Like, oh, yep. But yeah, like you try and get in very quickly yeah. so that you don't actually see the full bond of it. Absolutely. So let's go through a few things. So what's going on? You've mentioned it's anaphylaxis. I want you guys now to offer me. So we're going to go through the treatments quickly, but then what else are all the other things you need to do that you can, you know, as, as a nurse, you can totally own this space because you, you know, guarantee the doctor's going to be task focused on getting drips in and giving, you know, fluids and other things. So just quickly, what, what are the treatments? So let's not talk about CRM for a second. What are the treatments for anaphylaxis? Adrenaline, absolutely. So that's like 300 to 500 mics intramuscularly. You, you very rarely give it IV on the ward. So adrenaline, uh, and, and they say adrenaline, 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 but there's a couple of other things. What else do you reckon? Fluids, absolutely. They lose two liters in 10 minutes, two liters extravasates in 10 minutes. So I'd give a liter stat and follow it up with another liter without hesitation. Um, and then some of the most commonest drug you use in hospital? Oxygen, oxygen great. So uh, we'll go through, so oxygen, remove the trigger oxygen, lots of fluid, um, adrenaline, and then you can do all the other stuff that's important as well. But now, what else are you going to do? So I'm just going to go around the room and say, tell me all the other things as a nurse that you'll be absolutely having to own to make sure that the CRM stuff runs really well. What, what else do you reckon? Yeah, call the code. Call the code, absolutely. You're calling for help, mobilizing all your team together. Keep going, what else do you need? That's right. We would find out, we would find out from other people what other patients that nurse has and yes. we would go look after them. Oh, excellent. And that's so, that's so important because you're not just looking after one patient, you've got all patients to look after on the ward. That's a really great point. Yeah. Keep going. What, what else do you do? Make the environment safe around the food. Yep, absolutely. Clear things away. Clear things away. Excellent. That's good. So we're calling for extra help. And, you know, this is the in charge nurse and senior doctors. And, you know, you get a team of all the specialists around you. Um, state the likely problem and ask who's happy to lead, just like what you said. Who's leading this? You know, I really need to know who's going to take in all the information and make those kind of critical decisions, share the responsibility out. Discuss with a colleague, reevaluate constantly, and then, like you mentioned, transfer and plan. And I'm playing for the worst case every time. Does this patient need, is, are they about to arrest? Do, you know, get the crash cut in. These are all these really useful things that, especially if you code, do it, say, call it a code blue, it will happen. But what happens if it's not called because it's just a slowly deteriorating patient? You want to be that person to, you know, ask for that or mobilize that. So I'm going to tell you a bit of, you know, I'm, I'm talking to some experienced nurses here. As a doctor, the, these are all the problems that I, I have. Um, no one wants to lead because of the things we mentioned. Like it's, you know, it's confronting. You take on, you feel like you take on a lot of responsibility and you feel like you're being a bit, you know, presumptuous that, you know, oh, I'll, I'll lead this. Like it just feels very, it's hard to say, but you know, it's very un-Australian to lead, I think. <laughs> People think that cognitive aids are a bit of an insult to their intellect. You know, I can remember that, I don't need that. But the fact is that it takes nothing to just read something, just to check yourself. Uh, it's hard to, be, hard to be mindful to ensure that we close communication loops. Like, I know, Stephen, you probably know in theater that you know, the surgeon says something and sometimes you don't always hear it, but you, know, you may ask something of the surgeon. I, I ask things of the surgeon all the time and they don't always say, yes, I got that. It could be just a grunt or a look. <laughs> and I don't think that's satisfactory, but you know, it's up to us to help that facilitate that process. Um, and we don't always know everyone's name and how we can you know, properly address them. I mean, what have you guys done in a crisis when you don't know someone's name? Hey, Which, you? Yeah, hey you, hey, that works. I like the old point, hey, or, or, the, or the, like the tap, hey, yeah, you can actually say, can you hold my hand, you know, you can actually, yeah. can squeeze it, you know, you can. Yeah, there's, there's lots of ways to do it. But when I'm in a crisis, I find it's, it happens a lot where we just go, hey, can someone do this? And you haven't really looked at someone directly in the eye or you haven't tapped them and you don't know their name and it's awkward because maybe you've been around for 10 years and you, you, you learned their name the first time, but now it's too late. You, you don't want, it's, it feels embarrassing to ask.
Like one of the first things I do now, press the buzzer and say, hey, can you just make sure I have, you know, one anaesthetist, there's one reg and two nurses. I don't need the whole room for this particular. So, you know, again, as a senior practitioner, you'll know how many people you need for an arrest, how many people you need for an aphylaxis or any kind of blood loss or whatever it is. And crowd control is such an important thing as well. Um, so yeah, denial. We don't want to look like we're catastrophizing. True. Yeah, yeah. True. Even though you, like the patient looks dead. Yeah. But you know. Yeah, like, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's very hard. It just takes someone, it's like the, um, someone's arrested and it always takes a bit of time to start CPR because you're like, I, oh, it's, this is bad. But, and then you get on the chest. You know, that, that's a big part of what it is to be human. And it's going to play a big, big part in crisis as well. Uh, yeah, embarrassment if you overcall things, that always happens. <laughs> We're afraid of that, but it's, it's not a bad thing though. You, what, imagine you call and it's the wrong call, that's forgivable. If you don't call and it's the right call, often we also have too many instructions, so we get cognitive overload as I was mentioning before. Uh, so that's why we don't always, you know, we don't always act as effectively as we want to. Finally, asking the room, it's just so easy to just go, hey, can someone do this? Can anybody do this? Can, you know, someone, they, they talk about the four people that are most useless in an arrest, which is anyone, someone, anybody, and somebody, because you don't know who's actually gonna take ownership of it. So who's the most senior medical person at a met call or code? And where are they usually working? So, so I think about this and I think about, you know, when say the ICU reg comes in, you know, they're, they're the most senior medical person, but they're working in another, in another environment. So as we mentioned before, they don't know your staff. The senior nurse knows the staff who are capable of what they're capable of. Like, you know, you ask, you know, a very, very junior grad nurse to set up an art line. Well, that's kind of a useless thing to allocate that person. Mm -hmm. So I always find that, you know, the senior nurse, well, the task allocation is best done by someone who knows the staff well. So imagine that situation where the senior nurse or one of the senior nurses is, is there, next to whoever's leading the arrest. And it's kind of this to and fro of, hey, we need this done. Who's the best person to do that? They're scribing out all the different tasks and drugs because that's a really senior task to be doing that um, because it helps you know, run the arrest. But then they also know where the task allocation is. Mm -hmm. So often, I don't know if this happened, but I often seen the most junior nurse get the scribe role. And that's actually a really difficult role. With all the information flying at you, the senior person knows what to write down. Okay, so let, let's try some more examples. Uh, six-year-old male, post-op tachycardia. It's 11 p.m. and you're looking after a lovely six-year-old male patient and the patient had a lap collie that morning, very typical Williamstown, very typical anywhere kind of case really. They're well, no allergies, nil medications, which is pretty good. You're called to review him. The heart rate is 120. The abdomen is quite swollen now and there's quite a bit of blood in the drain. So, so what do you do? Let's just, uh, let's just throw this out there. Um, Take some obs, great. And the obs come back and they're pretty bad. Heart rate is 120, blood pressure is 70, uh, respiratory rate is up at 30. Met call, yep, met call, absolutely. It fits code law met call criteria, depending where you are. Uh, so you've called for help, that's great. We've already got the CRM stuff going. What else do you do? You do? ECG, fantastic. Uh, so you get that and you, do, and let's say you do a whole lot of monitors. Think of the CRM stuff that we talked about. Let's go through it. What else do you do? And, and you do the bloods, yeah, and the venous gas comes back at 70, let's say. So the HP is 70. Beautiful. What are you anticipating and planning? <laughs> exactly, right? This person's only solution now is to resuscitate them and get them back to theatre or the surgeon to assess them, right? So that's great. You're anticipating, planning what's going to happen. So you're managing this patient and you're going, hey, theatre, don't start another case. We've got a case coming down. You know, that's, that's what it takes sometimes keep going. Any other things that we missed? Cognitive aids. What cognitive aids would you need in a, if you're losing a lot of blood? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. We had the mother cards. Nice. So yeah, massive transfusion protocols are a protocol. The mother cards are also really useful. Um, I've got to say, I've managed many, many postpartum hemorrhages. I still like to use the cards just to make sure I haven't forgotten something. Um, but that, yeah, you know, every time it happens, you, you hopefully forget nothing, but I, I want to be sure because I'm already cognitively overloaded and probably a bit stressed and everyone's kind of charged up as well, but that's, that's exactly right. Post-op bleed the CRM, I think we mentioned a lot of these, we get the help of all the appropriate staff. We we're talking about the multiple priorities, so fluid, IV access and bloods, lines, warmers, pressure bag, blood bank, monitoring, and transfer to 
uh, you know, recovery, ED or acute ward or theater. Making good time, that's good. So 70 year old male with chest pain, it's 11 p.m. and you took a bank shift uh, as the ward nurse overnight at a small peripheral hospital. Let's say Williamstown again, because that's a fun place to be. Uh, the patient admitted for observation with atypical chest pain, but now develops severe central tight chest pain. Uh, no allergy, smoker, 120 kilos and hypertension. Becomes unresponsive with no signs of life and no breathing effort as you enter the room to review him. What do you do? Yes. Good. I, I heard call for help. There's obviously this is a code blue type situation. And jump on the chest. Absolutely. If you haven't done your ALS or your BLS recently, or you can't remember it, it's okay. You've got cognitive aids, right? Easy. Uh, what other CRM stuff do you want to think about? in this particular case. Anticipate and plan. Where, what, what's the cause of this and where are we gonna go with this? Uh, yes. Transfer to ICU. Great. Intubation. Yep, intubation, transfer to ICU. And what's the problem here? What's the cause, do you reckon? The cause. Yeah. Um, cardiac arrest. <laughs> so it could be a cardiac arrest yeah. due to the coronary thrombosis. Could be, yeah. And so where does this patient go? Cath lab, because that's the only or place they're gonna, the exactly. And not every hospital can do this. Like only Sunshine only got this facility, you know, a few years ago when the ICU opened up as well. So knowing that, being able to call the right hospital to get the patient transferred. So not the ICU with CCU. So cardiac arrest, the CRM way, again, lots of extra help. You know, cardiac arrests are tremendously high workloads. Like you just don't need the medical specialists and the health professional, you need the orderlies and the on-call people as well. This is an arrest. I've got all of these priorities with chest compressions, getting the defib pads on, ventilating, IV access and taking bloods, adrenaline and a fluid line and then transfer to a cath lab at a tertiary hospital. And this needs then mica and ARV as well. And just remember chest compressions needs lots of people. I often run a minute each person and just go, yep, swap. Minute, swap. <laughs> it's tiring, right? Have you had to do it recently, chest compressions? Oh, yeah, that's right. Cognitive aids again, ALS flow charges on the defib trolley, but again, you've got Google on your phone if, you, if you've forgotten. Maybe you're overnight at a small hospital somewhere and you just can't remember, that's all right. You've got everything at your hand with um, the tech we've got now. And then, as I mentioned, discuss with colleagues, reevaluate constantly. And the worst case, obviously it's already happened, but I've, you know, I've already planned for this. So in summary, you know, that was a really busy list of things that I was you know, talking about. But if I summarize it, you know, if you ask as, as a nurse, ask who is leading this, have a senior nurse allocate tasks with the leader, yeah, anticipate the worst case scenario, and get things ready. You might want to Google the cognitive aids and search them just to make sure you have everything right. Uh, and then where does patient need to go? I feel like these are the really, you know, these are the critical points that you can do to make CRM more effective. So who's leading? Allocate tasks with a senior practitioner, anticipate the worst case and get things ready. Google search cognitive aids and where might this patient need to go? Thank you so much for watching ABC's of Anesthesia and especially to all the participants that shared their experiences and their knowledge during the session. Now, next time you might have a crisis, please consider using these CRM principles because they really do make a difference. Thank you so much for watching. Please share with anyone who might be interested and see you again next time. Thanks.